Today, we are going to study the book Understanding Bodhicitta, which is divided into nine chapters. I will read the titles of each chapter and section. Chapter 1. The Mind of Ordinary Beings Formation of the Samsaric Mind How is the Samsaric Mind formed? Cultivating a Good State of Mind As ordinary people, how do we cultivate a good state of mind? Chapter 2. Misconceptions of Generating Aspirations Among Buddhist Practitioners Two misconceptions. Generating aspirations due to attachments. Regressing to samsaric minds after generating aspirations. Originally, on the path of Buddhist practice, we are supposed to generate renunciation and buddhicitta. However, in this journey, one might regress to samsaric minds. One may mistakenly believe that one has generated buddhicitta, but actually hasn't. This is a misconception. Chapter 3 how to correctly generate aspirations. It formally expounds renunciation and buddhicitta here. Renunciation. Buddhicitta. Chapter 4. The Greatness of Buddhicitta. There are two sections in this chapter. The Greatness of Buddhicitta. Buddhicitta is the gateway to Mahayana. Chapter 5. Types of Buddhicitta Buddhicitta in Aspiration Buddhicitta in Action Chapter 6. The Causes and Conditions for Generating Buddhicitta There are several methods. Seven Steps of Cause and Effect Meditation to Generate Buddhicitta Exchanging the attitudes towards oneself and others. Ten causes and conditions. This refers to the ten aspects to meditate on in order to generate bodhicitta, expounded in an aspiration to give rise to bodhicitta. Chapter 7. Characteristics of bodhicitta. There are five sections in this chapter. Awakening, selflessness and altruism, boundlessness, equanimity and universal compassion, freedom from the attachments to form and attainments. This means not seeking rewards. Chapter 8. Examples of Practicing a Bodhicitta. Chapter 9. Conclusion. Generating buddhicitta is a huge challenge for one's ego because as long as one has ego, one cannot generate buddhicitta. However, after generating a genuine buddhicitta and gradually eliminating ego grasping, all problems can be resolved. This is because buddhicitta is the best weapon to eradicate the attachments to self in person and self in phenomena. This is the conclusion of the book. Now, let's briefly study each chapter. Chapter 1, The Mind of Ordinary Beings Formation of the Samsaric Mind The Samsaric Mind is gradually nurtured. This statement is quite clear. For example, the habits of smoking, drinking and playing games are all gradually nurtured. No matter what an ordinary being does, they are gradually nurturing their karmic habits. According to the Yogacara school, karmic habit seeds give rise to actions and actions nurture the karmic habit seeds. This statement, although simple, has thoroughly revealed how the mind operates. When a karmic habit seed encounters an object, 
the intention to do the corresponding action arises. The process of doing it is called action. Meanwhile, the action also nurtures and reinforces the karmic habit seed. So, the arising of all our afflictions is due to the corresponding karmic habit seeds. Without seeds, afflictions won't arise. Everyone has attachments, but what we are attached to are different because of different karmic habit seeds and different degrees of karmic habits. Those with deeply ingrained karmic habits have strong karmic force. If they don't follow their karmic habits, they will feel uncomfortable. Therefore, humans usually create positive, negative and neutral actions driven by karma. Cultivating a good state of mind Our knowledge and skills also follow the same pattern. As long as we constantly learn and train, we will gradually cultivate and acquire them. The same goes for worldly virtues. Usually, ordinary people learn the Confucian culture to cultivate good qualities and virtues in this life and to develop good habits from a young age. As the ancients said, when a child is three years old, we can see what they will be like after they grow up. When they are seven years old, we can see what they will be like in this life. When a child is three years old, the karmic habit seeds from their past lives gradually arise. At that time, it's important to proactively correct their bad habits and cultivate good qualities. This is akin to the fact that it's easy to straighten a young sapling. However, after it has grown into a tree, it's difficult to straighten it. Therefore, early education is crucial. When it comes to early education, Let's talk about prenatal education. Prenatal education is about educating parents rather than making the fetus listen to music. A fetus starts hearing at around 28 weeks, and even if they can hear, they cannot hear music. They can only hear the sounds of the mother's digestion in her abdomen. After the mother listens to music, she will have a good mood and healthier blood, which is beneficial for the fetus's health. The mother's state of mind can have an influence on the fetus. After the mother listens to music, she will have a better state and a broader mind, which is very beneficial for the fetus. In fact, prenatal education doesn't start from conception. Education before pregnancy is more important. Real prenatal education is the education of the parents before pregnancy, which gives them a good state of mind. Of course, there are different states of mind, and the highest level is bodhicitta. If both of them learn the Buddha's teachings and generate genuine bodhicitta, they will definitely attract a soul with the inherent qualities of bodhisattvas to join their family. In the past, Asanga and Vasubandhu in India were brothers. Their mother practiced bodhicitta every day, making great aspirations and praying for bodhisattva to be reborn in their family. As a result, she attracted these two great bodhisattvas to join their family. This is called prenatal education. How wonderful it is. However, ordinary parents may not be able to generate bodhicitta, so what should they do? They can cultivate virtues and kindness engage in the ten virtuous actions, and practice generosity. Then, during conception, 
they will definitely attract souls with good virtues, great merits, and good health to be reincarnated. This is about the law of cause and effect. This is good prenatal education. It's very important. During pregnancy, the parent's state of mind and bioenergetic field can influence the growth of the fetus. Parents can listen to positive music and watch positive videos. If parents maintain a good state of mind, the birth delivery will be smooth. Moreover, the baby will not cry often. It will be easy to raise them. After they grow up, they will be well behaved and easy to guide because they have good roots of virtue. In recent years, some people in the child education area have introduced the Montessori education method from the West. However, they forget that this education method is based on religious belief. Western countries generally believe in Christianity, with a strong religious atmosphere in the family. From a young age, children are instilled with religious values and the practice of virtuous deeds. Without religious belief, this method won't be successful. Instead, it may make children more egocentric and self-indulgent. Chapter 2 Misconceptions of Generating Aspirations Among Buddhist Practitioners Generating Aspirations Due to Attachments Some people are moved by the solemn and serene atmosphere of monasteries. When they enter monasteries, they feel peaceful, so they want to approach the Three Jewels and study Buddhism. However, if they simply cling to the serene environment, what they eventually achieve can only be attachments. They consider the mundane world noisy and cling to the tranquility of monasteries. Some people, after entering the Buddhist community, find it too bustling, like a tourist attraction. They don't like crowds, so they go to Taoist temples and become Taoist practitioners. I had such a disciple. He used to study Buddhism with us, but later he felt there are too many people here, so he went to a Taoist temple. He found the Taoist temple tranquil. He told me that even though he lives in the Taoist temple, he is still learning and practicing the Buddha's teachings. He is attached to tranquility. Some people have the karmic habit of celestial beings. They like to meditate and enter deep concentration. After death, they may be reborn in the form realm. This is because they are attached to tranquility. The beings in the form realm are attached to tranquility, while the beings in the formless realm are attached to the state of emptiness. Why are they still ordinary beings? It's because they are attached to tranquility, to the limited spiritual attainments, and to the bliss of meditation, and they dislike the physical body of the desire realm. They sit cross-legged and keep their six senses still, feeling tranquil and comfortable. As they meditate for a long time, they may gradually develop supernatural abilities. Their consciousness may pop out of their heads and wander outside. However, they are stuck in this state, without seeking further progress or expanding their perspective. Such people like flying, so they may be reborn as birds in their next life. We cultivate wisdom and eliminate afflictions, not seeking supernatural powers or fame and fortune. They don't understand us and even look down upon us. 
They believe they have achieved great spiritual attainments and don't really know about their current status. They are attached to the limited freedom and don't know what true freedom is. They don't know how to eliminate ego grasping as they are trapped in the cage of ego grasping and wrapped by the shell of ego grasping. They can never transcend the cycle of samsara. Regressing to samsaric minds after generating aspirations. When we work for the benefit of sentient beings, the most important thing is to save sentient beings and liberate us from the cycle of samsara. Unfortunately, somehow, most people deviate from their initial aspirations while carrying out their mission. In other words, they gradually forget why they start. Especially when their mission reaches a certain scale, they may even wish it to continue expanding, like how a worldly person would think. They forget the attitude that a practitioner should have when working. As a result, all their samsaric minds arise again. In the beginning, they have cultivated a little renunciation and buddhicitta. However, as their mission expands, they become influential with a great mission and many disciples. As a result, they gradually lose their initial aspirations and regress to samsaric minds. That is, they regress to the mindset of the human and heavenly vehicle, which is characterized by the fondness of practicing the ten virtuous actions. Although they are also benefiting sentient beings, helping them and practicing the ten virtuous actions, their intention is samsaric rather than a bodhicitta. This is because they have forgotten renunciation and lack the wisdom of non-self. As their positive karma, activities and merits grow, their ego expands. When it reaches a certain point, their samsaric minds culminate and they are eventually possessed by the Mara. The Mara lives in the top layer of the desire realm heavens. So when the merits of ordinary people reach a certain point, they are prone to being possessed by demons. This is very dangerous. Chapter 3 discusses how to correctly generate aspirations, including renunciation and bodhicitta. Some people haven't properly cultivated renunciation and may have initially cultivated a little bodhicitta, but they mistakenly believe that they have cultivated renunciation and bodhicitta quite well. They don't know about their current status. Yet, they directly start to work for the benefit of sentient beings. As they work, somehow, all their samsaric minds resurface and their renunciation and bodhicitta fade away. They regress to a worldly mindset and the habits of the human and heavenly vehicle. They are attached to things, success and results. They have deeply ingrained ego grasping and perceive everything as real. This is very dangerous. In the age of Dharma decline, there are many such people in the world. Therefore, when one has accumulated great merits, it might be terrible. As their merits increase, their ego also expands infinitely. Eventually, they won't listen to anyone's advice. If one forgets bodhicitta and engages in various virtuous actions, it is called the work of the Mara. The Buddha has foreseen this issue long ago, so he said this. When they first start their practice, they may have a little renunciation and bodhicitta. 
what the Buddha said is aimed at these people. If one forgets bodhicitta and engages in various virtuous actions, it is called the work of the Mara.